Well, good morning, Discovery Church. All right. Pastor said uh, the second service is rocking, so I, I can't wait uh, to walk through God's word with you. I can't wait to, uh, to dive in. It's just a, such a pleasure, such an honor to be with you this morning. Uh, I really appreciate and thank you for last September, uh, maybe willingly or begrudgingly, sending your pastor to our area uh, of the world to, uh, to, for us to, to go around and, and see places together. I don't know if he was able to share some of that with you last fall, but it was such a joy to, to go in many different places, cover many different miles together, and, and really just, just lay down, lay down at the foot of the cross, lay down, Lord, what would you do in this place? What would you do amongst these peoples? And, and not, just, not just for me and my family, who my uh, wife and, and some of my kids are, are here today, but what would you do together with us, with Discovery? What would you together, do together for the kingdom of God to build his church here? See, we serve in a place and amongst the people where yet today there, there aren't any followers of Christ. Yet today, there are no churches in their native language. And so we say today, and back in September, Lord, what would you do? What would you do as we partner together? And I'm here representing my organization, representing many others to say thank you. Thank you for the gifts you give every week. Thank you for the sacrifice you, you surrender so that me and so many others can serve King Jesus around the world. The prayers that you support us with on a weekly, be it a daily basis, that you're giving, you're going, you're sending, and you do that all for God's glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much. It's it just, like I said, an honor to be with you. First time here at Discovery. Now, I've been here before. Years ago, um, at some meetings here, but to be here on a Sunday with you to participate, participate, and it's, a, it's an active participation, amen, in worshiping our King Jesus, uh, in word, in worship, in music. And so as we do that, as we pivot from our active participation in lifting up his name, and his gospel in music, as we pivot, let's do so in the word of God. And this is not a, okay, stop, start. This is a continuation of our worship to the Son. So as we, we open his word, whether it be in the old school way, you know, in paper form, or the new school way on your phones, and no matter what way, it's going to be on the screen behind me. So whatever it is, it's going to be there for you to, uh, to, to see and to, for you to grow and to be in. And of course, uh, so thankful you have these nice sermon notes. So uh, you can write down some, a few tidbits that I might throw up, throw out. Sorry, throw up and out. Whoa, we don't want to do that. Uh, sorry. Anyway, <laughs> I may uh, present and share with you. Uh, on this special, special Sunday, the beginning, the day before the beginning of the school year. So it's, it's an exciting time. I know parents are excited. Woo! Summer's over. I hear you. I've got, I've got five kids. Uh, our schools won't start till September. So uh, we've got another number of weeks before we get to uh, get, send the kids off, um, send the kids off willingly. I know parents say, amen, yes. It's time for them to go back to school. Uh, or if they're homeschooled, it's, uh, yes, we get a pivot. And, yeah, okay, they're still with us. Okay, yeah, same old, same old. Anyway, no, no. But uh, the excitement, uh, however it comes, of the beginning of a new chapter, a new year, where kids will grow in wisdom and knowledge. And we pray. We pray an exciting year for discovery. discovery and we pray an exciting year to set out for each and every family here. So as we, we get to dive in, I love this quote 
It's kind of old school quote, but a quote from Warren Wearsby. And it says this. When the child of God looks into the word of God and sees the son of God high and lifted up. That was my own. They are changed by the spirit of God into the image of God for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. So we want to this morning be changed into the image of God for the glory of God. All right? So as Pastor said, so where I'm just picking in, I'm just jumping in to your series here, the fifth part. Uh, hopefully, I pray it was providentially. We'll see as we get into the word. But, but hopefully over these first four, it's been transforming your mind in how each of you can live more on mission or missionally for our king. Not just on Sundays, not just a designated uh, period of outreach throughout the week, but how can you can do it at school as you this Monday, tomorrow, how you can do it in the classroom, how you can do it at work, how you can do it in your neighborhood, how you can do it as you go to the store, wherever it is, how you can be a light for Jesus Christ. So as we, we get into this, he wants, as he, we see him sharpening and equipping his disciples in the first century, the Spirit of God is doing it in the 21st century, right here and now, in Fort Pierce. He's doing it on the Treasure Coast. He's doing it in Florida, as he said he would, throughout North America, and praise God to the ends of the earth, all right? And you guys are a part of that. You guys are a part of that. Even though you may feel distant, you may feel, okay, okay, this is, you know, something I read about on the news or something I read about in articles, No, you guys play a part of that, just as Pastor said, because you are actively giving. You're actively sending him and a team next year. You you are participating in all that manner. So I praise God for that. I praise God for that. Okay. In fact, in fact, it's really interesting that uh, just this past week, just this past week, as I was preparing uh, for this message, I saw that in North Carolina they carried out what they call Project Serve, or Serve North Carolina. Now, I know the big news, of course, good news very rarely gets the front page, but in, in South, Southern Baptist churches stepping out last week because of the weather, I know, like, anyway, the weather got the big news, but little was said about the almost 1,200 Southern Baptist churches in North Carolina serving in their communities, in serving in 90 of the 100 counties throughout North Carolina. 45% of the Southern Baptist churches were actively engaged in being the hands and feet of Christ in communities, soup kitchens, food banks, doing all that they can to serve people in Jesus' name, even in the midst of a tropical storm, even in the midst of bad weather, disrupting things. They were there. Here's a quote from one participant. For, from one participant, Just as I was once far off from God and now have been saved and given a faith family, given hope by the grace of God, I love getting to love on and serve the less fortunate and marginalized in my city. Brothers and sisters, this is what Jesus has called us to. This is what he was sent forth to seek and to save that which was lost. All right? I pray this, this same movement will continue throughout the Southeast, will, will continue here in North Carolina and here at Discovery. So today we're going to look at how Jesus heals, heals, and gives hope. How he heals and gives hope in this specific passage. All right? And not just physical healing, although that will happen miraculously, supernaturally, because God in human form, Jesus, is present. But even more so, he seeks to heal hardened hearts. He seeks to heal people that have grown callous to the things of religion. He seeks to to butt up against comfort zones of religiosity that we see in the Pharisees. 
So brothers and sisters, let's dive in. Let's get our hands dirty. Let's see what God has to teach us this morning in his word. And not just us. The hope is for the nations. The hope is for the nations. So last week, Pastor Tim brought you up to verse 8 and ended, Jesus in the, is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And only, only in him can we find true rest for our hearts and our souls. Amen? Only in Christ can we find true rest. Not the rest that the, the world may promise. For we find what too often the world just gives us the opposite of that. It gives us anxiety. It gives us worry. Things to worry about. We watch the news. We, we watch things going on around us. It's, it's not positive. It's not uplifting. It just wants to pile it on. Because we know, we know the adversary, the devil is there to want to put that on us. But no, we run to Jesus who gives us rest, who gives us peace. So this morning is really a continuation of last week as probably the past weeks have been as well. In verse 9, we see as you look up behind me or, or in your word, is going on from that place, that place of confrontation. The word says that he went into their synagogue. If you mark or take notes, see that. It's their synagogue that it says. Yet it what? Is the Father's house. We know often Jesus said, I go to my Father's house. We know it is his Father's house. Yet in this specific way, it is their synagogue. And it's not just referenced here. Yet this is the first occasion Jesus is cited in the synagogue, in the Gospel of Matthew. But in this Gospel, the synagogue seems to be a place of confrontation. Jump over to the next chapter, chapter 13, verses 58, 53 to 58. It's on the, nope, okay. And it reads this. When Jesus had finished these parables, he left there. He went to his hometown and began to teach them in their synagogue. See that again? Their synagogue. So that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this, isn't his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, aren't they all with us? So where does he get all these things? And they were offended by him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household, in his household. And he did not do any many miracles there because of their unbelief. So there was confrontation. There was There was instability. And Matthew continues to say, their synagogue. The scene has the same structure and point as the one at the beginning of chapter 12 that that Pastor Tim mentioned last week with Jesus and his disciples picking grain on the Sabbath. No, Jesus is deliberately provoked by the Pharisees by a test question rather than by merely watching. So it's kind of like a setup. They could have just, you know, observed, seen what what he was doing in this text. But no, they were testing. They were creating a hostile environment. Posed not for information or discussion of a point of the law. No, but in order to accuse Jesus. You see, the Pharisees were bad people. It's easy to point a finger at the Pharisees, right? Man, they were always butting heads with Jesus, or Jesus was butting heads with them. But before we get too hard on the Pharisees, let's see this as a word of caution. I'll repeat that. Let us see this as a word of caution. And I say that because, you know, 
Archie Kendall wrote a book, You Might Be a Pharisee If, 25 Things Many Christians Do, But Jesus Would Rebuke. Anybody happen to read the book? Okay, they might have read its uh, similar book, You Might Be a Redneck If, and maybe some people, anyway, I'm kidding, there's no, <laughs> there's no similarity, there's not, not the same, anyway. So, uh, you might be a Pharisee if, and he says this, he says this, church, a Phariseeism, legalism, and self-righteousness is one of the sins that anger Jesus the most, yet we are often, the church, myself, you, in bondage to it without even realizing it. How can we recognize the warning signs in our own hearts and lives and yet, and then be set free? Let me pose a couple questions. And uh, you don't have to raise your hand, but if you want to, that's fine. Just public, uh, proclam- you know, public confession here, a little public confession. A couple, a few, have you ever questions? I have to be very transparent here because my wife is in the room. So, uh, Anyway, consider, have you ever considered yourself a better Christian than others? Yeah, I have to confess, I have. I have. Have you ever enjoyed pointing out others' faults? (laughs) Have you ever enjoyed pointing out others' faults while ignoring your own? Yeah, amen, amen. Have you ever failed to practice what you preach? Yeah, yeah. Well, brothers and sisters, if so, you and I might be a modern-day version of the religious leaders known as the Pharisees. In Jesus' day, whom he condemned for their legalism and self-righteousness, it's time for us to take a hard look at our attitudes and behavior and allow what? The Holy Spirit to set us free. Let the Holy Spirit set us free. I pray if we leave here, we're set free. We're set free from the bondage that can come. And we do so with a repentant attitude on a daily basis. We go to the cross on a daily basis. You don't see, you don't have to wait to Sunday to come and let it all out. So the curtain is broken. We have access, direct access to the Father through the Son every single day. Whether you're in your car to work, whether you're on your in the car leaving work and you said something to a coworker or someone else that that may have hurt them, you can confess it to the Father and then be open and repentant to your worker. Nothing displays a more Christ-like attitude than a repentant heart, than a repentant heart, because you're pointing, it's not about me, it's all about Christ and what he's done. Amen? Amen? Okay, so verse, as we continue going on, verses 11 and 12, Jesus tells a story. Jesus tells a story, all right? Kind of that Mary had a little lamb story. And it's similar to what we see in Luke. Luke 14, 1 through 6. Luke 14, 1 through 6. Turn there if you want with me. Similar but not exact. All right? And it says this. I want one Sabbath. Here we are on the Sabbath again. Take note. When he went in to eat at the, ho- at the house of one of the leading Pharisees, up oh, there they're back, they were watching him closely. There in front of him was a man whose body was swollen with fluid. In response, Jesus asked the law experts and the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. He took the man, healed him, and sent him away. And to them, he said, which of you whose son or ox falls into a well will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? They could not, they could find no answer to these things. They could find no answer to these things. In our story, what? It turns, it turns to what? They then started a plot. Unlike Luke 14, In Matthew 12, there is a different conclusion. See, if we continue in verses 13 and 14, the Pharisees reveal their true nature 
by what? Resolving to kill Jesus. Resolving to kill Jesus. But this was all in the plan. The Pharisees needed their hearts healed by the grace and mercy of God, just like we do. Jesus was the healer, but their hearts were hardened to building their own kingdom and not the Father's kingdom. And church, brothers and sisters, we need to be careful that today in our own lives and in our own churches. Too often in, about, in North America, it's about building our kingdom. It's about building churches that reflect us, not the Father. And we need to be so weary of this. And we need to be wary of this overseas. We need to, we need to hold solid to the word of God and want to reflect him. No matter how that shape looks, shapes or sizes, we want to reflect the Heavenly Father. We don't want to build or wreck something that's all about bringing us honor. No, we want to build something that only points to Christ, only print, points to our Heavenly Father. It is, a, it is a word of caution to the church. Let's look in 1 Peter chapter 2, 21 to 25. 1 Peter chapter 2, 21 to 25. I'll give you a minute to turn there. For you were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He did not commit sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, the cross, so that, having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. Did you hear that? He bore our sins in his body on the tree, on the cross, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. For by his wounds, by his stripes, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Amen. This is good news. This is good news, church. We need to be excited about this. This is liberation. Woo! Amen. All right. A little woo, woo. Anyway, <laughs> amen and hallelujah. Okay. Because of his sacrifice, 24, and at the end, as we see in verse 14, as this conflict section comes to its climax, the shadow of the cross falls upon this. You hear that? His death is determined by the Pharisees and the shadow of the cross of Christ falls across it. The cross where Jesus bore our sins, yours and mine, was buried and three days later rose again. That is the healing that only Jesus can give. That is the healing that only Jesus can give. Jesus' response to the threat was to what? We see in verse 15, withdraw. The withdrawal, though, is not to positive, uh, passivity, but to the work of healing that he does still on the Sabbath. Instead of retaliating, what does Jesus do? He heals. Verses 16 and 17 in Matthew's gospel, the command not to make him known is directed to the people he has healed. And it is understood by Matthew as a dimension of his picture of Jesus as the meek servant of the Lord. Like the suffering servant of Isaiah, Jesus works quietly, avoiding publicity and acclaim. He doesn't seek out the masses and, the, you know, they come to him. He's not worried about filling stadiums. He's worried about impacting lives. He didn't pick 200 disciples. He picked 12. And really of the 12, he poured into the three. And that's what he can do for you. And that's what he can do for me. So as we continue on, 
Now we look and see the hope that only Jesus can provide. The hope that only Jesus can provide and the hope for the nations. The hope that only Jesus can provide and the hope unto the nations. Verses 18 through 21 is a quote from Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. And this is portraying the servant of the Lord. This servant of the Lord who, what, heals and suffers on our behalf and the behalf of others. God the Father is the one speaking here, describing his son, the servant. Similar to the scene we see early at the beginning of Jesus' ministry at the baptism, right? Who's speaking? The Heavenly Father is, which also uses servant vocabulary as well. Though this text points back to the beginning of his ministry, he also, it also points forward to the conclusion of his ministry, which is his death, his resurrection, and then his ascension. Yes, church, Jesus is coming back someday. Are you ready? Jesus is coming back. Be prepared. Be prepared. Don't miss this invitation in verse 21 is to all the nations. All the nations are invited to this. Until this point in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is focusing in and his disciples on the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. But now it's it's up. It's up for all the nations, all the peoples. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue. But that's what we see in Revelation 7, 9. Every tribe, nation, tongue, and people will be worshiping around the throne of Jesus Christ. And that's why we labor. That's why we partner together for this great task. Between the great commission and the great multitude, we are in the midst of the great pursuit. And we do that together. We do that together. I'm here to say thank you. Thank you for your partnership. But you too can have a role in this. You too can play a role. You can go. You can go somewhere in the world. You can go and have a greater impact where he has you now. But be faithful. Be faithful with what the Lord has given you. Jesus the Messiah, the servant, will announce justice to the nations and his disciples after his ascension carry on this mission in the first century and church we are called to carry on this mission in the 21st century nothing has changed nothing has changed just praise God there are more of us (laughs) there weren't just uh, a few now there's many more and we need to continue we need to build on this we need to build on this we can do this We proclaim King Jesus victorious over death. The grave is empty. The personal way of victory over sin and death must go through the cross. Must go through the cross. There is no substitution. Which leads to the empty tomb. Which leads to the empty tomb. Church family, as we close our time, I want to share a quick story. A story of a number of months ago, I was at a gathering with some other workers and we were just sharing about our different accounts and our different places where we serve and a woman stepped out and started to go around and pray over our feet I think you're familiar with the passage likely in Isaiah 52 how beautiful are the feet of the one who brings good news So Discovery Church family, I want to, as we close our time, I want to pray over you. I want to pray over each of you. I want to pray over your feet as as you start a new school year, whether that's as a student in the classroom or as our teachers instructing our students. I want to pray over your feet that, that you leave this place on mission, that you know the news you you carry and bring to a lost and dying world isn't the same news that they see on the the five o'clock or the 11 o'clock news. This is good news. This is good news of salvation. This is good news of liberation, of justification in the one and true God. Amen. 
All right, let's pray. Heavenly gracious Father, what a, a blessing it is. What a, a gift to gather together this morning to proclaim Christ and not be scared for our lives as, as so many of, our, uh, of your body does in places like Northern Africa and the Middle East and parts of Central Asia and South Asia. People that fear uh, for their daily lives that uh, evil will be done against them because they bear witness, because they name the name of Christ as their Lord and Savior. So we pray and lift up the church, Big C Church, around the world. Embolden them, give them courage to be your light in so many dark places. But I also, Father, want to pray at this time for Discovery Church and each and every one here. I want to pray over their feet that as they leave this place, they would realize their role in being witnesses for you, in being a disciple that makes disciples that makes disciples. And they would go about their life with intention and purpose. And they would draw on the strength of your word that gives them hope for today and hope for tomorrow. It's not from the things of this world, but they find their hope in the person of Christ who died, was buried, and rose again and is victorious. And that those that are in Christ are victorious too over the bondage of sin. So Lord, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for these people as we partner together to see your gospel grow and expand and your plant, church planted in places that it has never been. All glory and honor go to you, King Jesus. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.